whiskey making, long a Virginia tradition, with roots that began when the first European immigrants came to the New World, is once again forging new frontiers. With great spirit and know-how, making whiskey is clearly equal parts science and art. So stay tuned and learn what it takes to make America's best single malt whiskey, right here on Made in Virginia. Made in Virginia is brought to you by At Union Bank and Trust, we salute the dreamers, the thinkers, the doers, the believers, the builders, and the makers. Thanks to your vision, hard work, and innovation, you make Virginia shine. Union Bank and Trust, a partner of Virginia business and a proud supporter of Made in Virginia and Virginia Public Broadcasting. The distilling industry, rapidly developing throughout the Commonwealth, is a time-honored tradition, and nowhere is that tradition more honored than at the Virginia Distillery Company in Nelson County. Here at what many call a whiskey amusement park, amid Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains in Nelson County, is Gareth Moore, son of Virginia distillery founder, late Dr. George Moore. Gareth continues his father's dream of reinventing America's single malt whiskey production. My father was an uh, immigrant from Ireland and uh, made Virginia his home. And uh, I'm not sure if it was the, the landscape, definitely not the climate, but uh, maybe the people that uh, reminded him of home and, and why he embraced uh, uh, Virginia as his new home. He, uh, he did a lot of things in his life. He was mainly a tech guy, but um, had, a, had a passion for single malt and uh, wanted to bring it to Virginia. He had a vision for a distillery that was going to take the old world techniques, traditions, and processes and bring it to the new world that he made his home. He's certainly not the first guy to have had that sort of vision. That's, that's, that's an American tradition of taking the best of the old world, immigrants taking to the country, making it their own, making it our own, and making it better. And that's, that's, that's American products from uh, hot dogs to hamburgers to, uh, to sushi. Uh, we take the best of the old world, we bring it here, and we make it better, we make it our own. So we had a huge migration back in the 1700s. Scotch-Irish immigrants came through. They came through Pennsylvania, New York, and they made their way down to Virginia. When they arrived in Virginia, it actually reminded them of their homeland, and they called it the Southern Highlands. So you are situated in Eads Hollow, and this was the site of a little shot house back in the day. Lots of people call this area the Fruit Loop. There were orchards all around, still are. So you have this ready supply of a sugary fruit, great for conversion to alcohol. And these immigrants, they brought their knowledge with them, their history and tradition of, of making whiskey, and they taught it to their descendants. So we're carrying that on right here today. Today I'm a consultant. I do uh, uh, legal and consulting services for people in the alcoholic beverage industry. But for 20 years between 1994 and my retirement in 2014, I was secretary of the Virginia uh, Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control the last 15 years of it, I was also chief operating officer. In 2006, I, I checked the, the records, there were eight uh, distilling licenses active in Virginia. As of the end of this, the last fiscal year, well, actually as of last night, I checked the, the records, there's about 56 active uh, distillery licenses in Virginia. We have more distillers in Virginia than they do in Kentucky. Well, here in Nelson County, we actually remained a dry county far after prohibition was lifted. And it wasn't until Hurricane Camille swept through and devastated this area that the government decided, we need some revenue, and we're going to open back up the, uh, the traditions that we have and make it legal again to distill in Nelson County. Not too far from here, uh, in Franklin County's, you know, the, the wettest county in the world, they, they, they called it the, the, the moonshine capital uh, of America. Uh, so yes, we've had a lot of uh, illegal distilling going on in Virginia uh, for a long time. It's, there's, a, there's a history of it in, 
in this neck of the woods. I'm just glad that uh, they're coming out of the woods and, uh, and deciding to, uh, to do it the, the legal way now. Right here, right now, we're very much focused on building on the foundation that we have laid before us. We're very lucky to have such rich roots, and now we're taking a Virginia twist and adding it to the whiskey to make it even more delicious and even more local. So we work with local wineries and breweries, cideries, and use their barrels to put our whiskey in it, let it take on those flavor profiles, those extra notes, and the Virginia earth into uh, making what we do today. The location where uh, whiskey is aged, the maturation climate, has a huge, huge impact on the eventual uh, character of the whiskey. And when we think of uh, traditional places where a single malt is made, if it's Scotland or Ireland or certain uh, parts of Japan, um, it's a very mild climate. January and, and July don't, don't have too much variation versus here in central Virginia. Uh, we get snow on the ground outside covering up the windows in, in January and it's going to get pretty darn hot and humid here in a, in a couple weeks. Um, so kind of embracing that natural climate in the maturation process, in our warehouses the casks are going to be heating up, expanding, and pulling in whiskey uh, in the hot, hot summers of Virginia. Um, and they're going to be kind of uh, contracting, pushing it back out to the spirit uh, in the cold winters. Using time-honored whiskey-making traditions, science, and equipment from the old country, the distillers at the Virginia Distilling Company are forging ahead and creating a legacy of their own with a special Virginia flair. The focus of the Virginia Distillery Company is exclusively on the production of single malt whiskey. Two product lines exist. The first is the Virginia Highland label. This whiskey began its life in the Scottish Highlands. After six years of maturation, the Highland whiskey comes to Virginia for its finishing. Think of the Virginia Distillery Company as an elite, high-end finishing school for whiskey. Once the whiskey arrives at the distillery, its real journey begins. The Highland whiskey is transferred into Virginia barrels, where it will finish for a year or longer in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountain climate. Here begins the art of the finish. The whiskey and the distiller have a unique relationship. The whiskey, at some time in the future, will somehow let the distiller know when it is ready. I think it's really interesting that we're, we're creating product on one day, we have no idea exactly what it's gonna turn, turn out like in another day. Whether it's, it's gonna be something that's gonna be on the shelf in four or five years, or is that a, is that a 12 year whiskey? Is that an 18 year whiskey? Is that something beyond? Um, and we don't predestine that, you know, we don't put something on the cap saying, say, for five years or for 20 years. It's, uh, it's through sampling and the sensory analysis over time and, and really seeing when the whiskey is ready. Whiskey, the aficionados will tell you, has a soul. And this Highland single malt soul began in Scotland. And just like many of the pre-colonial whiskey-making Scots, this whiskey also needed to get to the New World, to Virginia, to experience its full potential. The barrels, multi-generational and strictly Virginian, were first used to age and store port, chardonnay, or cider. The majority of the Virginia Highland whiskey is finished in Virginia port-style barrels, with smaller batches of the chardonnay and cider finishes being produced. All are award winners and come with special attributes. Our flagship port-finished Virginia Highland whiskey um, is a great product, and it's great because we've got these wonderful relationships with local Virginia vineyards and wineries. Uh, we've worked with King Family Vineyards and Stinson Vineyards and Veritas Vineyards, and, and we're, we're also expanding this partnership as well with other vineyards around the area. But uh, each of these vineyards have port-style wines. Um, after those wines were, have been aged in, in casks, we, um, we then buy those casks or swap these casks out, and we finish our sixth year in these port casks. Um, and it's really the backbone of our port-finished Virginia Highland whiskey. It is the port-finished whiskey that carries the distinction of winning the most coveted World's Whiskey Award as America's number one single malt whiskey for 2017. The second product line is all Virginian. It's the new make, or spirit. It's a single malt whiskey, and over 300 gallons are produced daily. The production process is around the clock and on time, with Sunday off for cleaning and sanitation. Everything about distilling this whiskey begins and will be finished in Virginia. 
Well, you know, uh, taking the old world and the new world uh, is a way of, of not reinventing the wheel. We're not, we're not throwing out the, you know, the baby with the bathwater and saying that we need to have a brand new product that uh, has never been made before, but taking time-tested uh, techniques and traditions from the old world, Scotland, Ireland, other areas that traditionally made single malt, um, and making it here and making it our own. And so, you know, our, our equipment is traditional. I mean, this all came over from Scotland. Um, our techniques are traditional. Uh, the way we mash in, you've seen, the uh, uh, fermentation, the, the distillation. Uh, but really, it's, it's, it's the maturation, which we're, we're embracing and, and making part of our, our new world technique of using our local climate and using local partners for, uh, for casks that have uh, you know, given life to other products in Virginia. And so by taking the best of the old world, best of the new world, we're able to make a better product and, and call it our own and say that it's uniquely ours, made in Virginia. Production begins with the water. Known for its clear mountain springs and deep wells filled with pure water, the Blue Ridge Mountains of Nelson County have always been coveted as prime for whiskey making. That's the, the aquifer and the, the well that, that we've tapped into right here in Nelson County. We use that water to, we use that water for every bit of the process, from mashing to the, the spirit reductions prior to barreling, to the, to the reductions before bottling. Um, it's, it's a great resource for us and we've been trying really hard to take care of it. It takes roughly 3,200 gallons of water to make a daily run of whiskey which when completed yields right around six barrels. Each barrel contains 52 gallons. We start with a, a two row barley um, and that we, we bring that in, we mill it. Um, after milling, uh, you, you can essentially start off with um, almost the process of making beer. Um, so before we make whiskey, we, we kind of sort of make beer. Next in the recipe comes the grain. Malted barley is used. It is stored on site in this pair of 36 metric ton silos. From the silo, the grain is transferred to the mill. The result of the milling is called grist and consists of the hull, the meat, and the flour. The flour is sifted off and is sent to be used in a nearby Virginia bakery. We have a, a mill, it's a Bobie mill, an original from the 1920s. There's a unique story about the Bobie mill. Um, it was manufactured and engineered so well and so precisely that the, uh, the company actually went out of business because it didn't need to supply its customers with any parts or pieces and the mills just operated. Uh, they never broke down, nothing ever went bad on them. Um, so they went out of business. But we have one of the originals uh, and I've yet to have any problems with it. The grist, totaling 4,400 pounds per batch, is mixed in the wash tun with 2,100 gallons of hot liquor. So in the mashing process, there's, there's three stages of waters. And that first water, we call hot liquor, was the third water from the previous day's mashing. And that third water catches any of the residual sugars, um, any of the nutrient or mineral content that's left in that grain, and we retain that. Um, that's, that's still great nutritional value for the yeast. Um, so that hot liquor is the first water that's plugged in with the grist in the mash tun uh, on the next day's mashing. Um, but 66, 66.5 degrees Celsius is uh, the ideal temperature uh, for, for the first water as, uh, as strike water um, with the grist. That begins the conversion of starches uh, to into fermentable sugars. Hot liquor is actually much like a malted barley tea and is a byproduct from the previous day's mashing. In this sense, the DNA of this whiskey came from the very first batch ever produced in this Virginia distillery and it will be passed along to future batches. Once mixed, another 950 gallons of hot water is added to the mash. The mash in the wash tun is then drained into the underback allowing the sugary liquid, now called wort, to be pumped over to a fermenter. Once in the fermenter, a proprietary blend of yeasts are pitched into the wort. So we pitch the yeast into the wort right at the initial stage of fermentation, or actually during the wort transfer. Um, that gives the, the yeast a chance to rehydrate and kind of 
get invigorated and, and active. Um, and during that process, uh, the yeast starts to, to then consume sugar and create alcohol. We actually use a couple of different strains of yeast. Um, and during that fermentation process, uh, the yeast um, eating, that, eating those sugars in the, in the wort uh, creates um, a very sweet, uh, fruity essence in the fermentation. So you sometimes can end up with um, uh, aromas uh, such as uh, pear or apple or, or even pineapple and some tropical fruits. The wort is held in the fermenter at right around 77 degrees Fahrenheit for three days. A heat exchanger, or jacketed chiller, assures the heating wort is maintained at 77 degrees. Pulling heat off the wort as it ferments, the exchanger puts the excess heat back into the hot water, which will be used in the next batch. The wort ferments for three days. This is when the sugars from the malt are converted into alcohol to roughly 8%. After three days, this wash is piped into the wash still, where it is removed or stripped to 30%. These are now called the low wines. The byproducts of the low wines are spent lees and pot ales, which are recycled. Rich in nitrogen and trace minerals, the pot ales also have a second life as a fertilizer. The low wines are piped to the spirit still for their second distillation. Once inside the spirit still, the low wines are heated slowly from 140 to 185 degrees. It's a traditional double distillation method. Uh, so our wash gets transferred to our wash still. Uh, the, the wort becomes wash after the fermentation process. But that wash gets transferred to the wash still and we have a, a low wines and faints tank or a beer tank. Um, and that gets transferred to our spirit still. Uh, and then during the, the actual distillation process, uh, we make a couple of uh, spirit cuts. So when we're on spirit, we collect high quality spirit that's gonna be put into barrels and, and uh, then warehoused. Um, and then everything else gets filled back into our low wines and faints tank or our beer tank. Inside the still, the alcohol evaporates from the low wines and is piped to the spirit safe, where the faint or head of the batch comes off and are recycled for redistilling the next day. From 78 to 70% 70 alcohol, this is now the heart of the batch, and it is captured with a turn of the spigot in the spirit safe. This directs the heart of the batch to the bulk spirit receiver. At this still, a batch of 1,000 liters or 264 gallons is captured before the alcohol contents will start to fall below 70%. The spirit space is uh, special because, you know, other parts of the process, you're in a tank, you're waiting, you're, you're um, you kind of have to observe through a, a manhole, uh, but every single drop that we produce passes through that safe. And uh, to be able to witness and, and make sure the quality is really what we're going for, um, it's, a, it's a really special part of the process. And it's, it's a critical part of the process of making the cut. Um, when you think of all the technology that goes into manufacturing and everything that we're, we're doing here, all the bells and whistles, uh, it's amazing that the cut is simply made by twisting your hand. So depending on who you ask, you know, the barrels could have a huge effect on the end product, on the whiskey, um, and they, they certainly do. The maturation process um, is interesting because you, you actually end up with, with a loss in the long run. Um, after, uh, we, we try and take advantage of Virginia's climate here, so in the summer, we'll see, you know, hot, hot days, and, and in the winter, you'll see very, very cold nights. Um, and those climate differences are very beneficial to the maturation process. It causes those casks to, to breathe or expand and contract, and that pushes spirit into and out of the wood. Um, so we're gonna try and take advantage of that. But uh, the downside to that wonderful climate is uh, we'll see somewhere, we're, we're estimating somewhere around eight to 10% in losses. Um, so out of a 200 liter barrel, um, we may lose somewhere around you know, 15 to, to 20 liters in that barrel, but uh, we'll see great whiskey in somewhere around three or four years. It's certainly something we take for granted as kind of our, our workplace and uh, you know, looking at it as, as tools for creating this whiskey, but uh, it does look very nice, right? Um, you know, we don't use copper because it's shiny and, and, and looks nice. We use it because the metallurgical qualities of, of copper and, and creating whiskey are really important. Um, stainless steel keeps it nice and shiny. Well, 
you know, we, we keep everything nice and clean because you know, yeast and, and, and sugar, we don't want to get a, a, an infection anywhere, so keep things nice and, and shiny clean. Um, but putting it all together, it, it does look special and it photographs well. Um, but, you know, ultimately they're tools uh, to create our whiskey and, and that's really what we're, we're about. And I think the last part uh, is really why here in Central Virginia, the, the area we're in, it's, it's, it's really the human resources, a lot of talent, a lot of passion for folks that, um, you know, in, in various agribusiness from, you know, nearby wineries and, and breweries, um, but just a, a tradition of, of craftsmanship and, and really putting you know, people's heart and soul into, into what they do. And, uh, you know, I often say that, you know, this production facility, it's, 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 it's big and beautiful, but it's a lot of copper and stainless steel nonsense without the right team. And uh, we're really, really fortunate to, to have that asset. I dream of, of all the operations and, you know, all the work that has to be done and, and everything that goes on here. But um, uh, it's, it's great to see, you know, the, the fruits of our labor to this point. We've got a great crew. Um, not just here in the in the distillery, but uh, all around. So that's that's with the brand team, um, that's with our corporate team. It's it's the entire Virginia Distillery Company came together, and and all of those efforts combined helped us win that best in category for American Single Malt. It's great to be able to uh, you know take something that uh, you know is a facility based here in Virginia that we're bringing in grain using local guys uh, who are putting their heart and soul into the work, um, doing it here in a beautiful setting doing it here with our, our local water, the climate, that it's going to be uh, uh, impacting the maturation, and being able to share that and say that this is something unique to, to Virginia. Uh, this is truly a, a Virginia product, and we're very proud of that. It's really an exciting time to be promoting the Virginia spirits industry with the stories of the hills, the haulers, and the heritage dating back to you know, the Jamestown settlement, Virginia is the birthplace of American spirits. And we have a lot of rich stories that we can share and, and educate consumers about. When I tell people that there's 56 distilleries in the Commonwealth, they always look at me, their jaw drops. There are more distillers making made in Virginia uh, spirits than there are distillers total making whatever in Kentucky. I mean, you, you know, the, the big boys, they have Large op larger operations. I mean, obviously, if you've ever been on the Kentucky uh, Bourbon Trail, uh, any one of their distilleries would make several of, of even our largest distillery. But we have more of them than Kentucky does. The craft distilling industry here in Virginia is exciting. It's new. Um, and I think consumers are eager to learn more about distilled spirits, the process and how they're made. You can come here and experience the process from start to finish. You can see how the, the product is made. You can go to the tasting room and try different craft cocktails with locally sourced ingredients. Um, and it's, it's not only uh, an experience for your palate, but it's also an educational experience and also a story of heritage. I think authenticity is the key to who we are and who Virginia is as a state and a people. And we're hungry to showcase all that Virginia has to offer. For us, we have planted barley. It's growing up on the fields behind us, uh, on the other side of the trees, and we're excited to see what comes from the first yield this summer. We'd love to be able to incorporate as much Virginia as we can into every bottle. I was really drawn to kind of see through my father's vision to, to um, have a single malt whiskey made in Virginia, um, really reflecting uh, Virginia. Um, very much because it was it was a vision with an end that would have a product, something you can taste and touch and see and be proud of. And say this was made in Virginia and share it with your families and friends and consumers. Single malts are typically thought of as a Scottish product, where bourbons are traditionally American. There are many differences in the distilling process, the aging, and the ingredients. What ingredient that is required by U.S. law differentiates bourbon from single malt whiskey? Is it A, percentage of calcium in the water of the mash, B, percentage of barley in the mash, C, percentage of corn in the mash, or D, the type of yeast used? The answer right after this. Made in Virginia is brought to you by At Union Bank and Trust, we salute the dreamers, the thinkers, the doers, the believers, 
the builders and the makers. Thanks to your vision, hard work and innovation, you make Virginia shine. Union Bank and Trust, a partner of Virginia business and a proud supporter of Made in Virginia and Virginia Public Broadcasting. The answer is C, percentage of corn used in the mash. By U.S. law, bourbon must contain at least 51% corn, whereas single malt whiskey is 100% barley. Next time on Made in Virginia, it's all about being cool. No, not wearing the most trendy clothes or listening to the hottest music, it's air conditioning. And where do you think the world's most reliable and most efficient air conditioners come from? Surely that must be Virginia. Find out what goes into the development and manufacture of state-of-the-art air conditioning next time on Made in Virginia. If you would like to learn more about today's episode or suggest a Virginia manufacturer for the program, you may visit us at madeinvirginia.tv and at wvpt.net.